we're going to do some high poly modeling in this one and we're going to be working with non-manifold geometry while we do this and one of the biggest problems i've seen when people are trying to learn to 3d model they're confused by workflow because they watch one youtube video then they'll watch another they don't really understand the difference between going from low to high or high to low or mid poly where you go out in both directions high and low and so it's really confusing to know when you're supposed to do things how you're supposed to do things and all that fun stuff well when you're creating high poly models if you're just using them for baking purposes you can kind of do whatever you want to create the normals you'll need to cast onto a low poly you do the low poly later do the high poly first and then you can figure out how to make that low poly match the high poly and bake accordingly and all that fun stuff later on so focus on high poly modeling to get started and then um if you're doing it just for baking purposes you don't have to keep these as solid meshes you should break them down quite extensively think about in real life the way things are put together if the way they break down in real life or how they're manufactured in real life you can kind of mimic that with your high poly models right and so these meshes are they don't have back faces they're just faces to cast normals onto a low poly that's all they really are and so we don't have to worry about necessarily um making fully complete geometry or anything like that we create floaters more or less um and break the, the meshes up heavily so it's actually a lot easier to model this way than you think and so if you haven't watched any of my videos go watch some of those and then come back to this this little piece hanging out over here but um it's going to talk about the shortcuts, hotkeys, and all that fun stuff. We might miss quite a bit of that here in this one. Let's just kind of recap this kind of process. Let's say I delete the back face for now. Alt Z, get in and out of this. But you want to do something like uh, maybe bevel these corners, for example. I'm going to use a segment of 8. Try to use 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. That's usually uh, going to give you a center line that you can... Uh, Lod down to if you wanted to later on. However, if you're using, um, like you're doing like hex bolts or something like that, you might use 6, 12, um, 24, all that fun stuff, right? And that'll go off in its own direction. So there's two types of cylinders basically, or bevels, where you use those numbers. Now, uh, we could do like an inset here, press E, extrude this in. All right, so we start to break this thing apart. P, e, separate the selection, right? We got like a little back plate. Maybe this section here at the front. Uh, maybe we want this to be like this really large little thing here. Uh, so we can grab all this and we can separate it. Okay, so this is non manifold, non manifold, and non manifold now. It all has back ends with no uh, polygons. Not a closed shape. Uh, so then we could do other things like maybe a huge chamfer here. We can grab these loops and we can bevel these. And once again, oh, try that again. Maybe we use four segments on this because we can subdivide this. This is all quads. So if we hit Control 2, we can subdivide it. Now we might need to add additional elements like holding edges to do that. Or you can just kind of fill it with loop cuts if you needed to. Um, do something like that. It'll hold it in shape a little bit better, perhaps. But we're really only focusing on the high poly for now. We're not trying to get caught up with um, doing low poly stuff, right? And so that means we can do things like this, where we say inset, hold control, and that's more or less extruding along normals. Very similar. It's not exactly the same, but uh, we can shade it smooth. If we want this to be a sharper edge, we can bevel it a little bit. Only need three segments if we're doing a subdivision, right? So we can do things like this all around. Maybe we don't want this back section to drop down in like that. So we can maybe do like a loop cut here. Let's turn off subdivision edit mode. Okay, see what's going on a little bit better. Grab this, inset, hold control. We got a back face now. It just curves the subdivision around, so delete it, get rid of it. And we want like a big, we want like a big chamfer here, right? Then do a boundary selection. Don't forget, I'm using all these selection methods up here. Loops. Oops. Back to the. Uh, loops, boundary loops, inner loop regions, rings, loops, linked more or less. Okay, I got these all on shortcuts, so you can right click them out of the shortcuts or uh, use machine tools as well. It has some shortcuts by default. Uh, but you can see where this is going. We're able to do this stuff very easily. So we can like inset here, hold control. We just want to 
push that in that way, maybe. Oh, we can create high polys this way, guys. Really simple. That one might be a little pushing it there, but... Right, yeah, so... Shade smooth when you're doing subdivision. Shade auto smooth with a weighted normal if you're doing balloon end gun stuff. Uh, however, this one here, I want to match this one a little bit better. So I'm going to push this back a little bit. You can see that creates this little hole here, a little panel area, perhaps. I can press F to fill it, inset, E to extrude it, and now I can go back and I can uh, X and delete face. All right, so we have this result. Okay, there's a little gap in there. Not what we want. I'm gonna move it all forward. You just want to make sure you don't have holes for the most part. And you can see the back side here has a hole, so I'm gonna press F, inset, X, delete face. But we can still leave it as a man uh, non manifold mesh, right? Got a little bit of a gap in there still, but probably would want to work that out a little bit more. Okay. There we go. So we might be do, doing a bevel here. A little bevel in there. This whole segment here. I'm going to delete it again. Press uh, F and set it again a little bit further and then delete the back side. So we get something like that. All right. So now we got these nice panel lines going on. Subdividing, which is nice. Uh, when you're subdividing, of course, you can use less segments, which also will help because the bevels technically in Blender have like weird shading issues. Blender's aware of this, they're trying to fix it supposedly. But um see what happens with that anyways. And so this is a fairly dense mesh now that's subdivided. Or it's a subdivided mesh. It's kind of low low density right now. Uh, but we can work these things further later on. Uh, you don't always leave them at this resolution. When you need additional details you could try to cut them into position wherever you're trying to cut them in. Uh, but a lot of times that just doesn't work out. You might end up applying a level of subdivision. And so you're going to do kind of a typical artist workflow where you're doing large, medium, and then small shapes. Now with subdivision, it's unique because sometimes you can only hit your medium shapes when you do your smaller shapes. It's just something that might happen. So you have to get the hang of going kind of um, from a high res or low resolution to a higher resolution and what you can achieve at which. Uh, resolutions so when you want to do certain things maybe like let's just say this whole segment here we want it to drop down you can see like we could start to do this we're intersecting for now but when we subdivide again it's just going to be a nice smooth curve that's maybe not what we want and also we don't want it intersecting so we can only get away with so much here before we have to start doing a lot of manual uh, cleanup and whatnot but we can still work with it and maybe flatten this section down and let's say we take these two outer sections, press S and X, bring them in, oh, Alt-Z real quick. We select all the way through and bring them in. That's going to give us more of the shape we're looking for, right? Uh, but still not quite sharp, so we could add bevels to these right here. This is why you turn subdivision off in edit mode. It slows down quite a bit after a little while. Um, but you can see we can get that result with a subdivision mesh relatively easily. It's not really that big of a deal. And um, shade it smooth, of course. If your bevels are too tight, you might want to try doing them again. Or if you have a mesh machine, you can modify them with that. So um, in this case, we're going to rebevel a little bit denser or a little bit larger and this is good for low poly models in general for games as you can see as we get further away from this thing we lose all that detail anyways so exaggerating your bevels can be quite good but we now have this piece here in the middle and we could do a cube um, whoop, cubes away over there let's uh, shift right click here create a cube 3d cursor is where your objects come in at right so um, let's say we just want to have like a certain shape like this we'll do a segment we need this cut in right here like we're doing a microwave or something and normally if you do a boolean it just yeah it doesn't do exactly what you think there's sometimes it'll actually fill here the, correctly the way you think it should by using exact hole trend uh, hole tolerance sometimes that'll work sometimes it doesn't do nothing 
Uh, but what I really want to occur is I just need this topology on this shape here. Now, Blender's default way of doing this actually is pretty, I don't know, I don't think it works well at all. Uh, machine Tools, on the other hand, the Machine Tools add-on, uh, you can do this very easily by turning on the Mesh Cut feature. So it works just like a Boolean. It's basically a Boolean is what's going on. You take this, take this, right-click, Machine Tools, Mesh Cut, boom. It transfers that topology, that intersection, over to the, uh, the Mesh below it. And so that gives us an opportunity now to go through, clean it up real quick, because it technically is a Boolean, I believe. And um, we can do that. Now we can do things like inset or E and then S, S and X right there, and G, Y. We can start doing things like this, perhaps. We could do inset, hit O, do an outset. So I to inset, O to outset. Do things like that. Maybe do a loop cut here. And we don't have to necessarily split this all apart. We just shade it auto smooth or whatever. Um, and we could do a bevel here. We got a nice round back in there. Shade auto smooth. Not looking good, is it? Let's do a weighted normal on top of it. See what's going on here. AM merge by distance. It should look smoother than that. I don't know what's going on with it. We got doubles or something. Double faces. All right, I guess not. So, shade auto smooth. Oh, I got shade auto smooth cranked down. My bad. Needs to be at a higher level here. Let's do, yeah, something like that. That's what it is. That's what's going on. All right. So, we got that worked out, but we can separate this mesh as a duplicate. Now, normally you shift E, right click, right, uh, you hit P, separate selection, go into object mode, select it. You can work with it that way, right? Uh, machine tools add on once again you use smart face so you select the faces hit four is the default key um, and it'll create a duplicate basically separate it and then um, put it in edit mode so now you can just press a inset hold control press o to turn off the outset uh, now we can do this number real quick this is all quads it's non-manifold mesh because we did the inset holding control we don't get back faces which is nice and um, on top of that, now we can go through here. We can bevel if we need to in certain areas. Like right here. Do that. I don't like this area here the way it's doing. I'm just going to delete it for now. But we can do intersections if we really wanted to. It's going to be on you if you want to do this or not. Uh, sometimes it's okay. Sometimes it doesn't look good. But um, we can subdivide this as well. We don't need the way to normal with subdivision. Shade auto smooth. Or shade smooth, not auto smooth. So we can layer things up in this manner as well. Because generally speaking, your low poly mesh is kind of what we started with. You know what I'm saying? So when you go to create a low poly now, basically the same base mesh. And so you want to be really particular about this. You want to try to match them up as close as possible, generally speaking. So it might take you a little bit of time to get this kind of going right. But you don't do retopo necessarily like you would a sculpt, but this is more or less retopo of sorts. Like generating a cage around it. Okay, so you might you might do some things like that. You can see if I did all of those at the same time, that would probably be beneficial. The uh, eight segments. All right, so on curves, you want to try to uh, create resolution that matches the curve um, closely because you'll otherwise get this like in and out effect on a, a normal map or ambient occlusion or whatever. Sometimes it's extremely noticeable. Other times it's not so bad because mesh was a little bit closer matching, but you can always work those edges down lower and try to manually clean them up later after the bake if you needed to. Usually you would do the higher segment count uh, the first lodge, you just get rid of whatever excess you need to get rid of. So, here, like this one, might have to do like a chamfer on it first. And so, we'll still have to match these curves potentially. Sometimes that's easier said than done, but as long as they're close enough, usually it's not a big, big deal. Let's just try scaling this a little bit larger. But, yeah, so getting as precise as possible could be extremely useful. Because you might have to. 
Um, but you get the idea of what's going to happen here. So we can do our little changes. Just doing insets as needed. Like I was saying, we need these meshes to mostly match up. This one's not quite there, is it? Got to get pretty precise with this, basically. So what I'm going to do, because I don't like the way this one did, I'm going to press S and Z to the bottom first. S and then the X and the side. It's a little bit closer. I like that. This one's also very bad. So S and Z. S and X. So we're getting closer to it. It's a little hard sometimes to see what's going on and tell what you're working on. But you can do this. And it might be helpful to turn on random colors. So you can see the difference between them sometimes. Not always. Not always. Uh, not always be able to tell the difference here. But you get it about right. It's not too big of a deal. All right, so I just want to see what would happen if we go ahead and um, get a substance real quick, restart it. We'll see what happens if we unwrap this thing real quick and try to bake to it. So, do a border selection here. We'll put the seam on this side here. Why not? We do a seam here, maybe. We'll just put a seam back there, but it's not really a big deal because we don't have a back face, right? So this one here, we might want to bevel a little chamfer. Seam right in the middle. I think this will unwrap fairly well. So uh, we can just go ahead and you unwrap or the UV editor. You see it and then it doesn't look right. Press U, unwrap and change it to conformal. It's still pretty rough. I don't know why it's so bad actually. Shouldn't do that bad. Oh, I know it's doing that one. These ones aren't split in the corners here. That would do that. You have symmetry, you just mirror instead of selecting these, but I have my origin point off, so. And um, let's try that again. See how bad it looks now. Oh, sides as well. Those ones that did I? So those ones are easy to select at least. Only one edge, but let's run around and unwrap these things. Mark seams with Control E. Before you know it, you'll get a good unwrap going. A lot of times, I just leave this to be able to Control Tab into it, or Control Space Bar, not Control Control Space Bar. Um, I'm gonna repack it real quick, Packmaster. Turn on heuristic and bump up the count and back. So we're looking for 70%, 0. 0.7 to 0. 0.8 would be great. Anything higher would mean you more than likely have overlapping UVs if you have higher, which is sometimes needed. But in this case, we'll be all right with this. This should work. So we can export this low real quick. Doing only the selected object and then exporting. Uh, let's export an FBX. Selected object only. We'll call it low. Get out a forward slash there so we can hide that. Now we can select all of this. Export this FBX. We'll export this high. It should collapse everything as well. Oh, one last thing here. Usually you triangulate things, right? So anything with Boolean Ingon, you would triangulate. But hard ops, this is easy. You just add modifier, triangulate. That's pretty much all that's going to happen. And you can hold Alt and check click normals or keep normals. And that'll do it for all of them, basically. They're all set up the same now. Very fast and efficient to do it that way. Even, even if it's subdivided, it doesn't matter. But um, 
anything that's got a weighted uh, boolean ingot needs a weighted normal as well. So we can export this FBX. Oh, this one high. I need to re-export the low because of the fact that I didn't set it up correctly. Go back to it just for a moment. See, this high takes a lot longer to export. Uh, we'll bring back the low. Here we go. And let's add weighted normal. Keep sharp. Add modifier. Triangulate. Make sure you check keep normals. Oh, Re-export it real quick. Where was I at? Where was this exporting? <laughs> I just realized it's exporting in some other folder somewhere. Documents. Okay. We'll go back to low. Now we can go substance. Go to documents. There's our low. Uh, we can leave 2048 compute tangent space. That's fun. Just like so. Oh, it is not shaded smooth at all, is it? Or shaded auto smooth. Try that one more time. Okay. So we'll do new low. Let's just set it to 1024 because I'm recording. So let's slow down quite a bit. All right. And so there's our low. Make mesh maps. So let's take the high end 1024 2x take. Let's see how far off we are on this. It's going to have some ray misses, I think, because our meshes aren't really, really close matching. But oh, you know what? Surprisingly, not too far off. Looks like there might be a ray miss happening in here a little bit. Yeah, we got a little bit of skewing going on, I think. But overall, not too bad. Could potentially be a little bit better. I think if we work the normals and the UVs and all that a little bit nicer, wouldn't be too bad at all. Um, I'm just going to bump the distances out a tiny bit. We're going to rebake one more time. I think that might help that area. Okay, yeah, and it did, I think. But these little jagged sections like this, if it's not a ray miss, which I don't suspect it is, the ray miss would be not from the low, but on the high. Um, oh, it might. No, it's not. Um, it's because when you're looking at something flat on, and this is what the baker is doing, you'll see that turn cavity off here as well. This is a really sharp kind of little edge thing going on here. A lot of times it's better to taper your edges a slight bit, where you do something like this, where you make like an SX, and then an SD, and then we move it out. So now we'll have a better transition in this area, right? As opposed to what it just was. So if we were to go ahead and grab this little section here again, see if we got all of it. Okay, we export the FBX again, the high. You don't have to reload these. A lot of people think you have to like constantly go back in and reload it. You just bake mesh maps. When you click bake, it reloads it. So only the low needs to be reloaded. Right, we'll see here. Now that we've done that, okay, it's a little aliased, but it's not. Not as bad as it was, at least. And it's a little bit more identifiable what's going on there now. So let's do a 4x. That'll smooth it out instead of doing a 2x, right? You can see if you bump up to like 4k and you're doing 4 or 8x, it takes a little while to bake, right? Not something I want to do while I'm recording, but you see it's going to start getting nicer and nicer, especially if the resolution goes up as well. Um, but so overall, you're able to work objects very efficiently and very fast, right? You can see the back didn't work out too well, but um, this is not impossible to do. So you just throw a material on this at the end of the day. Test it if you want, but let's do the steel painted one. Yeah, you can see it works out quite well. This is a little bit of a dramatic change for um, the high poly there, because the high poly is pretty pretty deep. Uh, our low poly does not match that at all. So what we can do, take our low poly, potentially, go in this area, um, and we can 
use a boolean if we wanted to to punch out that exact shape which sometimes is actually preferable so we could try doing that say like for example uh, we want just the same curve basically so you can duplicate an edge p separate it and select it press e let's extrude it out this is what we got going on alt n recalculate outside af potentially we're going to take it to the low poly so we're going to forward slash to isolate both of these remove the uh, subdivision don't need to triangulate right now you could do a punch in here like so so we can still do boolean and gone for our low poly obviously and so all we got to do is try to figure out how to match them up a bit closer we'll find that little angle we need hopefully There you go. Somewhere in there like that. Probably ideal. Something like this. Okay. And so we can do Boolean Ngon high poly, low poly stuff, right? We can apply this Boolean on the low poly. Get rid of the cutter. Go back. Maybe uh, take this whole segment, bevel it a little, or chamfer it even. We'll chamfer this one. We'll place a mark scene. The reason I'm thinking chamfer is better is because it's kind of a transition between one detail to the next, so it's probably better. Um, but we could re unwrap this. You can see, and we can repack it real quick. Try to get it going right. Okay. And weight the normal, which it should have already been. Oh, it is. Triangulate got out of order somehow, anyways. Uh, so. Should be seeing some pretty decent results here. Shade auto smooth. I'm gonna bump it up a bit. I think that'll work. Okay. And let's export this again. FBX. To the low. Like I was saying, you gotta reload the low. So reload it. You can see now we have some depth to that. So sometimes, like I was saying, you have to match your well, generally speaking, usually. You want to try to match your low poly to your high poly a little bit more. You probably realize it needs to be pretty precise usually. Right, and so not too bad. It's actually almost right on the money, which is nice. So we can do little updates like that as we go along. This is why it's so important to get this kind of working relationship between Substance and Blender. Like you need to make sure that you're going to hit all the little little pieces you need to hit in your bakes first for the most part. The only thing you're not going to be able to fix right off the bat with Substance anyways is skews. You'd have to bake in Substance Designer to fix that easier over there. Um, but even then, sometimes you might have to do like smooth shading bake and then shade auto smooth bake. And it goes back and forth. There's a lot of like little uh, back and forth you can try to do it gets a little bit annoying i think it'd be better just to buy marmoset personally but i have, have not not done that yet so <laughs> i don't know but the thing is is that you can see where it, it goes right like this is clearly going to turn into a game model some things are a little questionable like whatever's happening right here it's like a big almost like rayness that's the scene doing that somehow I'd have to go look at that one and figure that out. You get odd chance. I just need to add like a chamfer or a bevel or something right there. It'll probably work better. Usually edge angle or something like that that does that. So, um, But the rest of it's not bad at all. We can see some of these seams. This material is not um, tri-planar or nothing. So it's going to show the seams every time. It's really the masks that mess this one up. But, um, but overall, if you're careful with your seam placement, Usually, it's not a big, big deal. Like, it's hard to see some of these seams. Like, there's a piece here. Even with a material like this one, which is kind of a prime example of um, not exactly tri -planner. It's not exactly great and seamless kind of a, a setup thing. So, it looks nice, though. I like the colors and the rust, but the dirt or whatever ground. And so, all in all, you do the same process, but do it for 
other mesh, right? See this one, I got a couple going on here. Oh, this was a quad remesh, that's why. So um, when, you, when I unhit everything, all when you unhide everything, all your quad remeshes come back. So I'm using quad remesh on some things sometimes. Um, but you can you can mix boolean and ingon uh, subdivision, make your objects just however you see fit. It's really not that hard once you get used to it. And then you just have to spend your time later on tweaking your low poly to match. And that's going to save you a bunch of headaches because once you have an object made and you know for certain what you want it to do, you can figure out if you're going to do low polys for just like a single button perhaps, right? Or knob or something. But maybe this gets baked into the, uh, the back plate on the low poly or something. Like maybe this does too or that. And so you can do those things later on. You don't have to always do them right off the bat. Uh, that's the whole purpose of having these ones here. Just to show you how this correlates with this same process. It's the same thing, right? Like this plate just got modified more. So you want to you know, modify it more. You can do these really easily, even with uh, knife cuts and things like that, because you can bevel vertices. So control B and V. You see? Extrude, scale, bevel, A, X, limit, dissolve. Type in 0 0.05. That's Boolean Ingon workflow technique, right? So you see, it's not hard to get this going at all. We've basically done the same thing almost. Except this also had a cylinder punched into it. Of course, I use mesh cut with the cylinder to do that, but um, it's not that it says you can't try to do something like, uh, I don't know, maybe a cut in here. I don't know how this is going to work. We'll see. Maybe we do a cut, cut these up. Take all of that and then do loop tools and circle it. That's usually what I do, but yep, you can see it works. So that's another thing you could do. Screw it in, scale it. Um, take that whole section, punch it out, or pop it out, separate it. E S I or select all I inset hold control. Subdivide. Get smooth. Grab that back face maybe. Inset. And set merge at center. Do loop cuts. Yeah. Very simple shapes in general. Once you get used to doing this, you'll have a lot more fun, trust me. Lining the low poly up should take the longest time, to be honest. Modeling the high poly shouldn't really be that hard. Shouldn't be I mean it could take some time depending on how complex it gets. But a lot of these simpler things you've seen out there on marketplaces and things like that, um, they don't take as long as you you think. Now on the flip side uh, Boolean ingon workflow can be quite useful because, well, um, a lot of times you can keep things non-destructive for as long as possible, which means you can do high polys and low polys at the same time. And that's what's really probably confusing a lot of guys because they're, they're seeing people doing this stuff. But it's, um, there's a tech, well, not a technique. It's about when you execute things. Like you might do non-destructive model. You might say like, this is what I want. This is what's going to occur. This is great. Um, it's all solidified it's all it's not non-planner it's, it's just individual components all over the place and then they do the same thing basically but instead of recreating the low poly by just creating new mesh they're taking the the model with the bevels and stuff on it and they're breaking it down back to a low poly converting it to a mesh combining them together and then cleaning it up and so a lot of that is a little bit confusing at first. So if you're you're really feeling flustered by 3D modeling in general, just start with high poly and then work out the low poly later. Right? It's the easiest way to learn, in my opinion, on how to create really good looking models. Um, is just by realizing that the the two steps there are kind of separate in a way. So high poly is important because you need to create your normals. You need to make sure that you don't have gaps and stuff like that. But um, You'd say like this is going to be the normal that bakes at some point right matter of fact you can see right here see how it's all arranged green on top purple down here okay so we go over to substance so um, get lined up here and go to actually let's just do the 2d view hit f3 oh we won't see it as well over there okay let's do it over here then uh, we're going to go to the bake mesh map so this whole drop down, there's two buttons you can use. Bake mesh maps is B, is material, and then um, C is your, your standard maps here. 
So those ones, the baked mesh maps are the ones we're looking for. The baked normal. Okay. You see here. This is what we're looking at. I think this high poly. Turn cavity off. Oh, it is off. Never mind. A little dark because of the uh, random. I'm gonna turn it back to material. There you go. Let's compare and contrast here. What's going on? Right. That's it. That's all that's going on. See, it's a little bit janky in here. Is that a fault of the model? No, then it's the bake. Right. We can see we can see pretty close or clearly that this is the same thing basically. Very similar at least. A little bit of weird baking is going on though. Kind of bit. Um and also because it is projected, it does look slightly bit different. But basically what it's creating is the same thing. So um, let's pick this one more time. We're only going to do the normal, not all the other stuff. I want to see how clean we can get this with just the normal. Maybe like a 2048. Uh, let's do an F4X. Okay. Okay. Normal bakes quite fast. And so now we're starting to see a difference here, right? A lot cleaner. And, uh, that's what. That's really what you want. You want it to be super clean like that. And let's take a look at the 2D view. What we're looking for here is the normal. We're not, we're trying to identify gradients. So like there's on these flat surfaces, there's no large gradients going across it of just different normal information. That's something you'll get if you smooth shade or you have something not quite set up correctly. Um, over here, this gradient is created from or that corner is from the um, the bevels, right? Uh, that, like I was saying, Blender um, has a little bevel issues with the shading, right? That kind of shows up here a little bit, but it's not too bad. This is really, I think, just a mix match of resolution. It's a, something you might want to keep in mind that a lot of people don't actually even bake that out. They just kind of... Um, make their high poly or their low poly and their high poly have the same amount of segments on uh, certain curves. And then it just, you don't have to worry about those kinds of things. But that's that's kind of the advanced territory, I would say. So, But overall, yeah, decent result. If you're in a pinch, you're trying to make, you know, game models, lots of them for an environment. But the more you understand, like, the core of this this idea of high to low poly you're going to be better off for it uh, matter of fact if you look at every game application like environment artist or prop artist or whatever there's always in that that description of that hiring post it's going to say can conceive a well-made low poly from a high poly mesh or something along those lines so that's the standard workflow in my opinion high to low most people would agree with that but I certainly have other opportunities to work a little bit differently if you wanted to, but this is really what's going to take you to that next level, I think. Once you kind of get it in your mind that these are separate kind of events here taking place, because what ends up happening is that this mesh, this high poly in particular, not the low poly, uh, as great as this looks, we're using a subdivision. Let's get rid of that. Go into sculpt mode. Hit control three, we can apply a multi-res. Alright, so if we had even little slight damages to this thing, we can do that still very easily with like a scrape tool. And this is what's going to pull you up to that next quality level that you just simply don't see a lot of. Um because a lot of guys just don't take the time to go this extra extent on their models you know, to make them look really pristine. And for, if you're building a portfolio, you have to do stuff like this. You have to really think about what you're displaying as a um, a potential employee. Like, do you bring something to the company, or do you not? Because anybody can probably just you know pick up pick up Blender and Box Cutter and Hard Ops and just start modeling all till the cows come home. Um, but are they capable of refining 
every little nuance and detail. I'm working with Boolean Ngon subdivision, this or that. You need to show all your talents off that show that you're a more capable artist, that you're a better hire for that company than, you know, just some next guy, basically. They, they really do have to pick up the litter there, right? Like they're going to want the best artists they can find, not just the, um, not just the mediocre people hanging out in the middle. And that's what I'm working on personally, trying to always push myself up and higher. And you should definitely do the same, right? But I like sharing this with all of you and I hope you enjoy it. So I'll check you guys out in the next video until then. Take care. All right.